You're listening to The Critical Thought, where we challenge our listeners to use critical thinking when examining the teachings of Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm -hmm. Hi, this is Lady C. Hey, this is JT. And welcome to another episode of The Critical Thought. And we have guests here with us today. Hi, my name is Spencer. Hi, my name is Robert. Hi, my name is Rodney. I was born into the Jehovah's Witnesses. I had um, spent 19 years as a um, practicing Jehovah's Witness from birth. And I woke up maybe about two years after I had gotten disfellowshipped. Um, I had spent a good portion of that time waiting to come back. But after about two years, I had started to see things differently. And it was my awakening. I was 19 when I got disfellowshipped. It was also in the year 2013. Um, and it took, uh, quite a journey for me to wake up. Everyone goes about it differently. My method actually wasn't to read up on, uh, ex Jehovah's Witnesses and their experiences. It was more so that in my pursuit to come back to the Jehovah's Witnesses, I began to restudy the Bible. I began to read the scriptures and reread the publications that, um, I had, was accustomed to as a youth. I mean, these things just started to have glaring holes in them because a close friend of mine who is now my significant other was also is also a Christian. And she has a very different way of presenting Christianity. And we had an, um, a lot of discussions about it and, it. and she helped me to see Christianity from a different light. And it stopped, uh, stopped me from wanting to go back to being a Jehovah's Witness because it did not add up with even what the Bible was saying. So... That was one of the first steps into me waking up. And I want to share with others who go out and decide to leave the Jehovah's Witnesses but want to hold on to their Christianity. It's very possible. And it's not only that, it makes a lot more sense and it's a lot more easy and it's more loving than what would be presented. Um, me personally, I strayed away from religion entirely and even theism. I'm an agnostic atheist now. But I see the uh, the very different distinctions between the, the Christianity that was presented as Jehovah's Witness and the Christianity of those who use it more as a love-based center than a more doomsday sort of thing. So I just I just encourage everyone to do their research and and study the things that mean things to them. Study the Bible if that's what matters to you, because you'll start to see things in a different light. Um, than the twist that the organization will put on. I've actually been associated with witnesses for quite some time. My dad, I was not born in. My dad is a, a relapsed Jehovah's Witness, I would say, several times over. <laughs> I've been in since, uh, I would say, 2001. I left in 2014. Um, I became uh, aware of uh, knowledge that um, wasn't being shared with me at the time at, um, when I was a ministerial servant. So I began to look into, you know, J.W critical thinker, jwsurvey.org, and then that led me to crisis of conscience. So through my own personal um, pursuit of knowledge and understanding outside of what the Watchtower teaches us, I was able to come to a better understanding of what was reality and what wasn't. And I faded. I did not get this fellowship, so I faded. In my personal experience, not being raised a Jehovah's Witness, it was shown to me at uh, like in my like 10 or 11. So being not raised as a Jehovah's Witness and seeing how my life dramatically changed and the friends and the way that I had to operate and deal with others and almost a way of being scared of people and being elitist in a way of thinking, thinking I'm better or superior or that, you know, my way of life is better. It was very difficult for me as a kid growing up, um, especially in the preteens, to separate myself from others and to be so isolated and be so non-social outside of the Jehovah's Witnesses. For me, you know, the reason that um, I left is because as I, when I think, like I said, when I was, I became a ministerial servant at 22, when I turned 24, I just started to really look at my faith. My grandmother passed away when I was 21 and I dealt with a little bit of depression. She was a lifetime Jehovah's Witness. She was a pioneer of 60 plus years, one, one of the origin, original pioneers in the area that I lived in. And so when she passed away, it allowed me to take a step back outside of just making her proud and my family proud and really look at what my faith was. And that led me to, you know, the crisis of conscience and the, the silent lambs. And, and I started to learn about the, many of the abuse cases. The funny thing is I actually dated a young lady in, in um, Canada 
and Rodney and Spencer both know this young lady. We had a great time. She actually left the Jehovah's Witnesses as well, but she was a victim of um, abuse as a child. And um, through watching that documentary about the, the folks and seeing her experience and how the elders handled her experience, she was actually still living in the same house with the person that abused her, still living in the same house. The elders disfellowshipped them once, but they still had her, they still felt comfortable with her living in the house with the abuser. So um, I actually, we, you know, our long-term goal was to be like, you know, ministerial, you know, be like, you know, go to Gilead or something like that. But when I came to that understanding of the different cases, of the Candace County case and the many different cases that were going on, then I saw how she was handled. Um, I had to come to a decision that I can't be part of an organization that preaches one thing, but behind closed doors, from an organizational perspective, they really were trying to hide and do those things. So I actually stepped down as a ministerial servant. And the way, and the way that I stepped down was I actually just didn't, you know, do parts um, and just made sure that I did a slow fade. So I never was, you know, judicially, you know, disciplined or anything like that. And the reason why, um, and it was, you know, it was very tough for me to leave. So the reason why I left is because for, you know, I like to be a part of something that I truly believe in and I can't say one thing and do another and also the experience with the young lady that I dated. And so I hope that my story will empower and encourage other people that, you know, there's never too late to leave. And, and even um, you may have a lot of family, you may have a lot on the line, you know, you have to do what's right in your heart and do, and you know, do what's right. It's been the best thing ever. I left when I was 24, I'll be 30 this year. And I'm so fortunate to have two of my friends that grew up with me to leave as well. And it's so encouraging to see after all these years that we're still our friendship, despite what we've been through and all those things are still intact and that we're doing well for ourselves as well. I came in at about 13 years old. I came in without my parents. It was something my older sister, uh, she's about 10 or 12 years older than me, had introduced to me. Um, and I left or was disfellowshipped in 2013. I think I was about 21 at the time. And uh, I had woke up maybe a year and a half before I was disfellowshipped and just slowly over that year and a half period, just uh, had less and less regard for the the rules that the JWs had and uh, ended up being this fellowship. Uh, my journey is also like like many others had a lot of ups and downs, uh, especially in the beginning. Uh, just losing your friends all at once is not a, a pleasurable experience for anybody. Uh, the JWs will have you believe that that's a, the rightful consequence of leaving the organization. Uh, when it's not, I don't think anybody really deserves uh, that sort of treatment outside of extreme um, sorts of behavior. Uh, but, uh, since then, after getting over that period of, of sadness, depression that comes from losing your friends and some of them, yeah, I still have affection for still love and care for dearly. Um, but once you get over that, uh, then it's just uphill from there. At least it was in my case because I was already at the bottom. So going up was the only, only option. And, uh, some things became available to me that were not available to me as a JW. Uh, there, there was, uh, for example, certain jobs I had as a JW where I actually left one because we were making parts for the military. Now I, I work a job where we make things for the military and I'm, I'm able to have access to that, to that sort of thing where I would not have had access to it. So now I'm able to associate with uh, people who come from different walks of life, uh, people with different lifestyles that as a JW, I wouldn't, wasn't able to associate with. Um, that includes my coworkers, uh, neighbors, uh, even family that I wouldn't wasn't able to associate with before, I now have access to them. So, uh, and one of the reasons that I think it's important for us to to be able to come here and, and share our experiences is because the nature of of disfellowshipping uh, or leaving the organization in any kind of way is that you're isolated and you don't have anybody that you can reach out to. And I remember when I had first uh, before I even got. This fellowship. When I first woke up, there was really nobody I could I could speak to about the things that I was uh, thinking and going through. Rob, fortunately, was was sort of on the same wave, so we had some conversations about it early on, and you know he suggested that I I fade and not just get this fellowship. Uh, but there were a few voices online who would share their experiences, and that's really all you have to hold on to. So uh, I think that's one of the things that makes. Uh, what we have here and what you guys have on your channel are very important. Excellent point. Um, the, the, the story that all of you guys have shared, uh, it just goes to show that there's an aspect about the witnesses that people know nothing about. And we actually provide an insight. It says if we literally pull the curtain back 
for people who are not witnesses to see this is what the other side of the smiling, clean cut, suit and tie Saturday morning witness is going through. Um, and each one of you, you've shared a, an interesting aspect, the ability to make people like yourself and others feel lonely. That is one of the societies, the branch, the organization's greatest tool. People often ask you, think they'll ever get rid of it. And, you know, you have to ask the simple question, well, why would you get rid of your best tool? Who gets rid of their best player? Nobody does. So this shunning uh, that we see, it will be around for a long time. In fact, we see it's actually, it's actually getting worse because at one time, you know, people could, like with us, you could fade. Now, fading is pretty much over with now, the way the organization is setting it up. And so people who have left, just quietly left on their own, they're getting calls from their family. Uh, you coming back to the Kingdom Hall? Uh, well, I, I, I'll, I'll think about it. No, 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 I need to know. You coming back to the Kingdom Hall. And so at that point, they haven't been in this fellowship, no judicial meeting, nothing. But they will then, going forward, treat them just like they were this fellowship and read off on a Thursday night. So the organization is literally tightening the screws, and we see that. And like I'm sure you guys can agree, uh, it is it is just it is like a breath of fresh air to be out. So this is why I know I'm glad we have to get you guys up there. You're young guys. Um, you've gone through some personal challenges trying to, like you said, you're at the bottom. You only can go up at that point. And that's the way we looked at it as well. I think it's an extension of what we were just talking about, the way that you lose people and having to come to the idea that there's certain people that you may never, ever have a relationship with. The thing about the witnesses is that they they set up a conditional love sort of uh, mentality where you're loved if you do this, if you're doing that. Um, and honestly, you know, even within the congregation, it's an unspoken hierarchy of people because you just have the people who are unbaptized, who have been there for a long time. They're looked down upon, you know, then you have people that are, you know, baptized, but they're not doing a lot. They're also, they're more looked, they're looked down upon, you know, then, you know, you have people who are striving for, I want, I don't want to call it like prominence, but it is of a sort, you know, I did the pioneering, I was a ministerial servant. So now you're looked up uh, up to and people are, you know, they, they think that you're just like innately better or you think you're innately better because in the end of the day, you're doing more for what Jehovah says. Um, I think that we should, uh, you know, as, as being out, it, it allows you to be humble and understand that everyone's just a person. We're all on the same level and we all get to experience each other for who we truly are and not for the titles and the accomplishments that you may or may not have, it allows you just to to take a step back and and analyze, you know, what you have and what you have lost. And the things that you have lost, while it may be painful, a lot of times you have to realize that a lot of it was based on conditional mentality. And um, some people can't shake that. And a lot of people that are in the witnesses, they are not able to shake it. And it's sad. So, you know, just... Treat, treat those that you have with love, the, the true kind of love, not the line of love that they say is true. The real, true, unconditional love um, that, that, that you can meet a person and understand that they have things they have to go through. And you do as well. And you just stay with them on that journey for as long as you possibly can and not look down upon anyone that you, you, you feel like isn't where you want them to be. Um, it's just a mentality that I felt like I needed to shake for a long time. It took a long time to shake it. And I'm happy that I've been, hopefully I'm on that journey, you know, to keep on growing in that aspect. I, I do have to ask you to repeat something. Yes. Um, something that you said is very, very important for people who leave. And this is one of the biggest, this is probably the biggest challenge that we face as we work with people, talk to people. You made the statement that when you leave the organization, as unfortunate and as sad as it is, a person may need to come to the realization that there is a possibility that they will never have a relationship with those who they left behind. And this is why people, if people call us, now, what can I do to show my mama to leave? And, and what magazine can I give my brother? You, sometimes you will have to reach that point. And, and, and could you just restate that? Because I think that's important that people understand when people like yourself and us and others, when we reach that point, it gives us a certain relief because you keep holding on to a hope that may not even be a hope. Well, in my household, my mother was very, very strict and um, very 
oriented toward witness goals. And that was her entire priority to the point where as though, you know, it's it's just it's what I made myself into to to be what she needed me to be and be what I thought was right. Um, upon me leaving after achieving pioneer and ministerial status by the age of 19, I, I, I was hoping that one day I could have another relationship with her. It took a long time, but eventually I realized that I may never have that relationship again. And it's sad. It doesn't feel good at all. But it's also peaceful and it's also enlightening almost because you you understand the the nature of what's happening. And the sooner that you're able to to understand it and come to grips with it, the 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 more likely you'll be able to look to the future and to build the things that you want and not dwell on the things that you've lost. Trying to pull people out, it is not the way. It doesn't work. It's not the thing that you should be focusing on. It is you you have to focus on. You've spent this amount of time living for someone else. You have to learn how to live for the things that you need and the things that you want. And realize what they have and what they've got going on may be permanent. And it's, it's a tough realization, but it's freeing. It's, it's, it's the way to keep that, get that ball and chain off of you. It's one of the last things I feel like you have to come through, come to, come to realize about it. But when you do, it opens up way more doors and windows that you have been purposely ignoring for the sake of going back to what you had before. We could not agree with you more. I mean, that is, for me, the most important thing that a former witness can learn. We have literally been looking into the face of what it means to be a part of a high control group or cult. And, 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 and it's hard to come to grips with. I was in that. And so I think, and we've, we've had this conversation many times, I think sometimes as witnesses, as a witness who has left, a person who's left, we forget what we were a part of. Yeah, and I'll second that as well. Like you, when you initially leave, sometimes you can almost hit your head on the door trying to force people to see your point of view or try to get, try to you know, finesse a situation where you can share some information. A person has to come to that realization themselves. They themselves have to do it. They have to, just like everyone has a process, just like Rodney has said earlier, Everyone has a process. Everyone has something that they're learning. So you can be uh, encouraging. You can be um, show, show them unconditional love and support, even if they don't show it to you. And you'll be available. You don't have to always say, hey, how's it going? You don't have to extend yourself more than necessary. But you also, if they have a situation or they need encouragement, you can say, hey. And, and for me, I always realize that, like, you know, and, and then I appreciate it. Rodney had said that, hey, I was there for him. Because they'll people appreciate that he left. I think he might have left before me. I think actually, yeah, Ronnie like might have left before me. But I had my process. He had his process. And here we are, all three of us are best friends and still doing it together. So don't hit your head trying to force or and hoping and, and thinking and believe. Everyone will leave when it's their time to leave. All you can do is be understanding, empathetic, and let them go through their process as well. That's something I've learned as well. Yeah, excellent. Think- comes to being disfellowshipped, uh, once that damage is done, it's already done. And especially if any amount of time goes by, even if there was some kind of way that you could re- reconnect with, with some of the people in your organization, after you've gone through your changes, uh, e- even if you could reconnect, there's no telling that it would be anywhere near the same or if the bond would still be there. And you can see that uh, exaggerated when when you're out of the organization and then somebody else comes out and you've both went through changes. Um, a lot of the people that you may have had a connection with while you're in the organization, you may have no connection with afterwards because of the changes that uh, two of you have went through. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, that, that's an excellent point. I, I think it's important to understand. And, and we, we try to stress this to people. You need to understand just because you agree with someone when you were in the organization. When you leave, you may find out that you have nothing in common with them. And the reason is very simple. It's very simple. We work for a book publishing company, and we know that because of the way it is structured. This is a serious business. And unfortunately, most Jehovah's Witnesses, they only see the front side. When you look on that back side, man, this is like a Fortune 500 company. Well, what about now with the um, pandemic? Like, 
do you guys have any experiences where maybe your family members are trying to call you to get you back to the kingdom hall because they're saying this is the end? What are your experiences? What are you hearing from your congregations? Well, it's been radio um, silence for me for years. You know, I don't I don't get contacted. Um, I do look into um, just to keep abreast of, you know, their broadcasting, the things that they're saying, um, you know, and, and me and Rodney and Rob was talking yesterday just about how, you know, if, if I was in there right now, I would probably think this is great tribulation time. I wonder if they're going to pull the cord on that um, and, and start to make that announcement, which would be very interesting for them. Um, but as, as regards to um, actual contact, none whatsoever. And that's sort of the way it's been um, for a while now. I had one brother reach out to me, and it was about four years ago, and had nothing to do with this. Um, but I hope that those are on the inside, you know, if you're watching this, that, you know, you find peace and, and understanding um, and, and not be all worried about the end of days. I know that's that's a hard thing to say to someone who may be in the witnesses right now. But, um, you know, things will get better. Uh, as we take the measures that are given to us by the medical authorities to get out of this. Um, so hopefully these things can happen, you know, in the timely fashion, excuse me, fashion, and everyone will come out on the other side as many as possible. Yeah, I, uh, my dad now, he's, uh, they do this, they do conferencing, video conferencing now. So I was talking to my dad and he was saying, oh, oh, uh, we don't have meetings, but uh, we got to go to J the website and be able to watch whatever broadcast. So now they control their information even more so. They have their one specific voice and they're able to control the narrative and the dialogue. So they've even doubled down on a way that they like to produce information um, to disseminate to their people. You know, so for me, I haven't I have had an elder or anybody reach out to me. I've been gone since 2014 to 2020. So I literally would say probably last five years. Not even a, not even a text, not even a call. They, and the funny thing is, every time my sister goes to the meeting, I'll say, "Oh, we miss your brother. Oh, we miss your brother." And then, or, or different folks will say, "Oh, we miss your brother. We, or we saw your brother." But the funny thing is, you saw me in public. You didn't walk up to me and say, "Hello, I'm not this fellowship," even if I was. Uh, but in this specific situation, I'm not this fellowship. I'm literally uh, just not going. And um, I'm, and I'm not a crazy person or anything like that. I'm very approachable. And not one person who has so-called saw me in public or seen me around town have said, oh, you know, hey, how are you doing? Let's check it up on you. They are terrified to even speak and utter a word for the, for the simple fact that you might uh, put some, um, you know, some, some uh, XJW cuties on them or something. So it's just so weird. <laughs> that's a good point. That, 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 that's a very good point. I haven't had any JWs reach out to me. I actually haven't had any reach out to me the entire time I've been this fellowship. And also uh, my sister and her husband, and her kids, they're no longer going to the hall either. So fortunately, I don't have any of that pressure coming from my family or, or my former friends, but I do see a lot of them online freaking out um, over the current events. This is like music to their ears. Uh, it's, it's actually kind of insensitive in some ways, um, in my opinion. But um, yeah, I haven't had uh, that experience. I think I want to address this issue with disfellowshipping. Because when a Jehovah's Witness hears that someone is disfellowshipped, they immediately say, oh, they were just doing something wrong. But I personally feel like people make mistakes. And there was this lady who commented on one of our YouTube videos. And the point that was made was Jehovah's Witnesses look at you and they hold you to this high standard. But in the church, you veered off course and you made a mistake. But Jehovah's Witnesses look at it as a failure. So when you're looking at yourself for the two of you who are, who are just fellowshipped, what type of love do you feel was shown to you when you made your mistake? Do you think that they could have helped you to have stayed in the congregation instead of cutting you off? I think naturally um, they it could be handled better. I think the whole this, this fellowshipping, shunning practice is unhealthy and actually a violation of human rights to a degree. You know, in my personal experience, I'm happy that they didn't uh, help me stay in the congregation. But um, I do believe that it's a very judgmental, shallow 
judicial approach where you have three men who are basically talking to themselves about whether they think that someone is deemed to be be a part of their organization, to be a part of, be, have a contact with their family. You know, for me, my mother and my little brother, if you're deemed worthy to even deal with them in the fullest capacity. And, you know, for people who make those sort of judgment calls based off of things that they did in their youth, it's not loving at all. And the entire practice is controlling. It's a control tactic. It's a fear tactic. They build a world around you and they threaten to take it away from you. And when they take it away from you, you're left with nothing. And not a lot of people have the ability to bounce back from that, especially when you realize that what you did is basically signing your own death warrant. You know, when people say things like you left the truth, you know, air quotes, the truth, it's, it's just, it's here to instill guilt. And that's another thing I was just, when I brought up that I would speak to my significant other about um, how she's a, 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 a pure, pure, more, more true Christian in the aspect that mistakes are mistakes. You veer off, you're forgiven. You know, it's one of those things we're human. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses look at it as a binding contract. And when you violate the terms of their contract, they are subject to take your life. Not not in the sense that they kill you, but in the sense that they take everything that means something to you and they leave you in the cold. And um, I can't say it's worse, but socially, I don't think it's anything that you can do worse to someone. Um, even in jail, you may know that people can come and talk to you, you know, but being isolated in a world where you, you have no actual walls around you but you're literally in jail um it's 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 a violation of just being a human and i don't think there's any love in it at all i don't feel that the disfellowship and arrangement is a loving arrangement at all in any kind of way um not only is the arrangement itself unloving but the way it's carried out is unloving as well uh, in my particular case when I first began to to wake up and I had a lot of questions about certain things in the, in the organization, I would bring these to the elders, to the ministerial servants. And what it would end up being was a hour long discussion, many hours long, where you'd have three or four brothers, sometimes up to six in the back room, grilling me as to whether or not I read uh, apostate material. And there was never any attempt in any of that to address any of the questions I had. It was just looking for some way to, to get at me. That, at least that's what it felt like because the, the questions I had weren't addressed. Um, and then eventually over time, that eventually led to me committing what they, what they consider a serious sin. Um, and that was, seemed like just what they wanted uh, to, to finally get rid of me. Um, but the arrangement itself, I, I don't think that it's, it's loving. Uh, it's, it's based on the elder's subjective opinion on whatever sin you commit. I don't know, they don't have any sort of objective way of, of dividing serious sin from any other sin. It just appears to be uh, whatever sin is the most appealing. Those seem to get grouped into serious uh, sins and the, the less appealing, or maybe we, they consider more minor, they, they don't group those as serious. But um, yeah, I, I I just don't understand where they draw the line as to what's serious. Uh, when a person's repentant, I don't think that's something that you can actually judge from an individual. So I, in my opinion, it should be done on a, an individual basis, just the way that everybody else does it. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm associating myself with somebody and I see that their behavior is not benefiting me, then I can choose to, to not associate with them. Uh, to do that organizationally, is uh, stepping over their boundaries. It's a violation of uh, their subjects' right to, to associate with who they choose to associate with. And I don't think anybody benefits from it, especially when it divides families, when children aren't talking to their parents. And friend to friend is no better, uh, not watering that down at all either. But when you, when you get to, to dissolving lifelong bonds uh, it, it's really painful. And as was mentioned, some of these bonds were just surface level anyways, and they weren't real, but some of them were real. Some of them are genuine, um, especially with your family and, and longtime friends. And to break those up 
when there is no other difference between myself and my best friend than that the Jehovah's Witnesses say we shouldn't associate, everything else is perfectly healthy. That's a really tough thing to deal with. And I imagine um, if the person is really my friend as well, that they are going through a lot of pain as well. And for no other reason than three brothers decided that that's the way it should be. Yeah. And the funny thing is how they try to distance themselves from like Charles Taze Russell. They try to distance themselves from 1914. They try to distance themselves from prediction 1975. They try to distance themselves. And then they like to control information by having their own separate Bible because they can write things and manipulate words the way they want. They can, they have so many ways to control information. And people would just say it's a loving arrangement. It's a loving, the Bible, Bible doesn't really even talk about specifically disfellowshipping. It doesn't use that word specifically. Jesus Christ didn't say disfellowship his, his, his disciples. You know, he said, you know, get, get away from people that are doing wrong. But it wasn't used. But they make their own language and they have their own loaded way of communicating. And people just accept it for, you know, if they say it, it's true. You know, it's very interesting when you mentioned the word disfellowshipping. Uh, if for those of you who have never had the opportunity to see what the Watchtower Society actually taught about this fellowshipping when the Catholic Church was doing it and they weren't. We encourage you. In fact, take a look at the link that we have below in the video and go and take a look exactly how the society described in detail how this fellowshipping, or in that case, it was referred to as excommunication, was to be viewed. And then in a very short span of time, they was actually doing it themselves. Okay, now um, I'd like to kind of talk about how you all picked up the pieces of your life yeah. after you left, because there's so many people out here right now that are afraid to leave, right? And I feel like to stay in this organization, they're doing themselves a disservice because they're, the more time they spend, the more time they're not preparing themselves for the future. So just kind of helping people who are on the edge of leaving, you know, can you help them to see what your life was like after you left and how you were able to pick up the pieces? For me, um, in my personal journey, uh, it started with me getting to, to get to know and have a better relationship, a loving relationship with the family that I had that was not Jehovah's Witnesses. That was the first start. My, my dad, stepped up in a very big way um, the moment that he found out, you know, about the disfellowship minute and the moment I got kicked out of the house, um, he stepped up and allowed me a place to be myself. Trial and error, though, is going to be the teacher. And that's just sort of the thing. Um, don't, due to being a witness, we are a bit socially inept when it comes to dealing with regular people, dealing with uh, just regular job situations, but we have a, a, a complex that's been drilled into our head. Learning how and when to overturn those stones, those entrenched stones of, um, of doctrine and indoctrination is really the word. Um, it, it all comes with time and experience, holding yourself up in a single place, doing the, you know, and, and not coming out is doing yourself a disservice. You have to do everything you can to try to get to know people. Reach out to the people that you had bonds with that you knew was you wasn't allowed to speak to. Old classmates, workmates, you know, schoolmates. If you are pursuing some sort of education, pursue it. Um, learn everything you can about the life that you want for yourself. You know, take your job, and of course, you know, balance is the key. But try to pursue the financial goals that you want for yourself. You know, these things are how you become a regular human being in this world. Um, it's not about viewing yourself as a chosen class. You know, losing that mentality is one of the first steps. Find people, get to know them, and get to know yourself by bouncing off of these people. And from there, You'll be able to adjust and it takes time, but it's worth it. So just just reach out. Reach out to those around you that you're told that you can't have association with. This bad association notion isn't true um, in a lot of cases. And for the ones that are, you'll find out quickly. 
inch distance yourself. But for everyone else, the majority of individuals, they're just out here trying to live their lives as well. And they have their own goals. And you can just find a way to work in um, what they're doing with what you're doing, what you're doing with what they're doing, and become a whole human. Yeah, I agree with um, what Spence said. Um, all of us have left in our 20s. So for me, leaving at 24 and not having a college degree, it, it definitely was difficult, uh, for, just speaking for myself. Um, you know, the area that I was in was a very educated area. A lot of folks had, you know, advanced uh, degrees, uh, not, you know, we're talking masters. So, and, and so in the workplace, that could be very competitive. But what I did was I knew um, that I was able to pick up information. I was able to uh, learn and I had the ability to read and write. So even though I did not necessarily have the formal education that everybody else had, I did have the uh, free uh, ability um, in school and <laughs> of life of talking to different individuals and connecting. So sometimes you got to use those skills that they use, the, the Watchtower taught you for a negative way to use it for positive. So for me, I'm able to communicate with people. I like people, so I'm in sales. I, I do that now as a living. So I took some of those skills that I um, used for for pumping out um, publications, but I used that for my own uh, life because it is tough, especially since a lot of witnesses don't have um, don't go to school. A good portion of them don't. So I just made sure that I was um, confident enough and took advantage of any learning programs and at work as well. A lot of companies do offer you and train you, are willing to train you and teach you. So see what's available to you. Um, and don't let yourself be a victim um, from a financial point of view because of what you gave up when you were in the watchtower. Um, and so for me, I just, you know, I did that, took advantage of education, took advantage of training at work, and I was able to get many different promotions and to take advantage of those things. So, yeah, you're not a victim. You have to leave that victim mentality. It, it can be tough. It can be hard. It can be um, so frustrating. But you have the capability, you have the intelligence, you are smart enough, you are capable enough, and don't let the negative feelings that you had within the watchtower carry over in your regular life. And just like Spence said, reach out to your family members. There's many different, uh, we've had a couple of family reunions that I've been to, and you get and find out that a lot of your family may be um, in certain lines of work, or they may be able to, you know, recommend you for certain things. And it's just also encouraging, like, you know, that you know that people love you for who you are. Um, and that you're not a sinner and that you're not a, that you're not a, a apostate or anything like that, that you are just a good person trying to learn. And so, um, you know, it's, like you said, it's going to be ups and downs, but you can do it. You are smart. You are intelligent. You are capable. And there's a whole bunch of people um, here that will encourage you and empower you as well and, and wish good things for you as well. So just get out of that victim mentality. Go get it. And um, I think that, you know, life will definitely put you in the right direction if you focus on being the best person that you possibly can be. Excellent, excellent, excellent. I think uh, picking up the pieces after being disfellowshipped, uh, after being disfellowshipped is such a unique experience from person to person that it's difficult to really give any uh, pointed advice to, to people from individual to individual. Uh, at best, you can, you can only give general uh, best practice advice. Uh, in my opinion, one of the best things a person could do is seek to find something that fulfills them the same way that the organization may have fulfilled them or they may have thought the organization was fulfilling them. And uh, that would involve finding some sort of passion, something you really enjoy, something that, that makes you feel good about yourself. And that's something that not always it's not always easy to find. Some people will take some years to find but the process of looking for it is also fulfilling as well. And, and you'd search for it the same way you'd search for anything else. If, if you didn't know where your keys were, you'd look at the place you think they most likely had been left. And if it weren't there, you'd keep working down a list of places you think it might be. And finding your passion is that same exact way. You start with something you think you might like. And if it's not that, you try something else and you, you repeat that process until you find it. And the whole entire process of you searching you're gaining skill points, you're, you're fulfilling yourself, you're feeling good about yourself, even if it takes a while to find uh, that what you're looking for. And I think that for, for me, that's been a huge help in putting the pieces together after being this fellowship, because that same level of satisfaction that I may have got from associating with my friends or, or going out field service, I now get that from the things I enjoy doing, playing guitar, building electronics, and, uh, that gives me that same level of fulfillment. Excellent. 
y'all see that Stephen Lett video? Um, the oh, last of the last of the last of the last of the last. I, I, sh I showed <laughs> my girlfriend that video, and she was like, "What did he just say?" <laughs> last, last. And she was like, "This is some crazy cuckoo stuff." I said, "That's what I grew up with." And that's, I mean, that's. But when you're in it, you're like, "Oh, you get you get oh, the last oh, what? Oh, what? You get all excited." But it's like when you look on the outside looking in, you actually look at it. It's laughable. It's, it's laughable, man. Yeah, the funniest hilarious. part is why do they always talk like this? I don't know why <laughs> this is the best way to give off information. Yeah, like, I don't even talk like, like that. It's so weird. With the <laughs> it's the three of them. It's like rubber roll, man. Mr. <laughs> Rogers' neighborhood or something. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. My opinion about the Stephen Lett, I think that he paid his way into the governing body this is a I don't know why they put him up there, man. I mean, out of all the people, there's got to be there's some smooth speakers, man. They could they could come with something better. He about man, he is corny. This dude, like you said, you show it to a non-Jehovah's win, and they would look at you like, what? You listen to that? Everybody we have ever shown it to is not a witness. They take like 30 seconds. You remember the guy from Heaven Gates? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. first cousin. First cousin. <laughs> crazy. First cousin. That yeah, man is crazy. Nuts. I can't believe it. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's true. You know? It's insane. We got one video too where he says uh, that we have more evidence for the God's kingdom than gravity, electricity, and wind. But he's using an electric mic while he's saying this. So <laughs> <laughs> gravity's keeping him on the ground. <laughs> mm -hmm. But you know, it, it just goes to show when you're in a high control group, mm -hmm. it, and this is the catch 22. This is the catch 22. There are people who are sitting in the meeting and they see this stuff. And they're like, I can't believe this. But because they're trapped inside, because there's a lot, believe me, there's a lot of witnesses. There's like a whole underground group of people who come to the meetings and sit there like, this is crazy, I don't know what. Mm. But because they got family and friends. They, they, they got they, a shotgun. It's like a gun to your head. It's like, you do this or we kill you. That's yeah. like the same thing Spencer said. It's like my dad and my sister, I, I got to a point with my sister, I said, literally, I said, if, when it all comes down to it, if the if you had the Bible in your hand and you had the Watchtower and there was no I said I said Berber if there was no if the Jehovah Witness organization folded tomorrow literally they just went bankrupt they just don't exist anymore would you follow the Bible or would you still go with the magazine which one would you go with and she said she would go with the magazine oh. I said Alberta I said if the Watchtower organization did not exist you still would live your life like them and not the Bible. That tells you how crazy. I said, and she said to me, point blank, I will never ever leave. I don't care what happened. Wow. I showed her, she said, I, I, the, the kids are getting abused, that's sad, but that's the individual brothers. They figure out so many back loopholes to get it, get out of the wiggle out of it. You can't deny it. And she would say, you know, even though the New York, I'll send her something about the New York Times. I won't even say nothing. I just say, hey, I saw this in the news. Just, you know, I, I don't even talk about it. I just say, this was in the news. You say, oh, where'd you get that? It's the New York Times. It's not some backwater magazine somewhere. It's the New York Times. It's an official publication. Everyone knows what the New York Times is. She's like, well, you know, that, uh, there's a, well, that's those specific brothers. Our society didn't tell them that. And so she, they have people so, the Kool-Aid is strong with the sugar, man. The Kool-Aid is heavy, man. And they got different recipes for different areas. Because one, <laughs> one thing I noticed is some of the issues you go through are regional. So if you bring up an issue in Maryland, that somebody doesn't have in California, they can pass it off as, well, that's just those brothers over there. But it's, it's the organization as a whole that facilitates the possibility to have those issues. Yeah. So even though this issue only exists over here, it still is an organizational issue. But mm -hmm. that opens the door for them to pass it off. Oh, it's just, mm -hmm. a, it's just those brothers. And the, yeah. Like, you know, mm -hmm. being able to like hear one thing and see, see something literally happening in front of you and refusing to believe it. You know, you know, and, and it's sad because I remember being that way. I remember people. I, I mean, just take it Rodney's experience. Rodney was in my sister congregation. We was in the same hall. When he was leaving out, everyone was talking to him like he was basically promoting demon worship. Like he was like, he's got involved. He's got his head all up in some, some demonic type stuff. No one would say what he was talking about, but everyone was just basically went as far as they could. You know, demon, demonic. That's the worst thing you can say is a witness, you know? So if you attach that to someone's ideology, that's why they said he's, you know, that's why he's gone. You know, he was saying some, 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 some stuff that was influenced by the devil. I was like, what? You know, but years later, me and Rodney just, we met, we was able to find each other, I think through Facebook. 
And we started talking and we was on the same wavelength. And me and him hadn't talked in years, like literally maybe four or five years. Same thing with Rob. You know, we didn't even know all of us was gone at the same time. And all of us was in the same circuit. All of us was trying, you know, to figure out our lives. All of us was doing it alone, you know, losing family, losing friends. And, you know, Facebook, we found each other. And that's that's how we was able to, like, figure out the truth behind the stories that we was told. Because Ronnie left months before me, you know, but he had already had it in his head already, you know. We was talking about just the different ways of going out. Me, me and Rodney actually at one. Of, I think it was the convention. Me and Rodney was sitting at a convention. He's laughing now because it's funny. I think that's when I knew kind of Rodney was on his way out because I was thinking about some stuff. And I think that's the last convention I ever went to. Me and Rodney actually we were room. We we room together, didn't we, Rodney? Yeah. Yeah, we room together, and we, and we were just talking. I was like, oh, we both gonna be out of here, and because we we were so called the cream the cream of the crop. Rodney was a pioneer. He was a pioneer and ministerial servant. I was a ministerial servant, and this is and then this is all in our mid twenties. So we're the so called cream of the crop of you society, man. We're like the so called up and comers. We were going to be the next so called crop of elders. This is the generation that's supposed to be the next crop of elders here, so to speak. So and for us to come to that, and we were up there. We're not even the regular. We weren't even the everyday witness who kind of goes, who doesn't necessarily put out ten hours. Who you know, we were the so called cream of the crop. So you know, like you said, there's a there's an underground railroad of people who are literally sitting there like man i just they're locked down they just can't get out so um it's, you know, yeah the nature of it though is that when you get this fellowship you can't reconnect so it, it could be years that go by that i'm not reaching out to, to spencer or rob because i'm thinking that they shun him when they just fellowship too so i mean the nature of how it works is, is that it, it works really well i for lack of a better way of putting it. You got to like yeah. poke your friends with a stick. Like, are you still going? How do exactly. you, you know? Are you, how's you that, know, how's that I mean, everyone that I know, you know, that I'm connected to, I, I don't come in strong, even though I want to. You come in and you just poke it. How's everything going? You know, are you still, and they'll be like, no, I faded. Oh, goodness. Okay, so how are you? <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah, 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 <laughs> then yeah, you yeah, really get out. to like, Understand, okay, so you're doing this, you're doing that. I mean, you know, just last weekend or the weekend before last, I met up with a few people um, in the same day that 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 I hadn't seen in seven years, you know, and they've been out and they're trying their best, you know, and they're, they've they got a family, you know, one of them's married. They're expecting their second child. She's a year older than me. I think she's in 26 or so, I'm 25. So, you know, it's it's nice, but you don't even know how to approach these people especially when you see them on social media living a double life, but they don't, you still can't come on strong. You still can't be like, well, then just, you know, you, you just leave, you know, you're doing this, you found your happiness in, in a certain other aspect, but it, there's just so it's, you don't want to lose everybody. I can really understand it. Like you don't want to lose people. And the, and the even crazier thing, I want you guys to put this in your brains. Like this is so crazy to me. One of my closest friends, right? He's in the Korean congregation. We're not even talking about, we're just talking about in the black American congregations here, right? Or the just Amer- American congregations. There are hundreds, if not thousands, in other non-English speaking congregations who feel exactly how we feel. But like my buddy, he was in the Korean congregation. I hadn't talked to him in five, six years. He just texted me just through Facebook and I found out he left as well. I'm like, there's probably three or four brothers in the congregation, in the Korean congregation. I know one of them for a fact. He was asking me questions when I, was a ministerial servant about uh, how do you know this is the truth? And I kind of gave him these kind of vanilla answers because I was on my way out as well. I didn't really tell him it is the truth or not. I just said, go with whatever you're, you know. But there's those, there's friends in other language congregations as well who, who don't know. And like, I wish there was an easier, like, that's why what you guys are doing is so important because in a way it allows us to have our own network or LinkedIn of people and somehow through just happenstance we'll make we'll, we can reconnect with people because that's the biggest thing you know um and i'm so happy that i have these two dudes in my life they are they're literally make me so to see them where they are and what they're doing and how we support each other and talk to each other it is the greatest joy of my life to see these guys doing well and, and making things happen and not making excuses and not letting themselves be victims you know yeah that's very true um very very powerful point because when we leave we want to move on with our lives so that we can do well we did a video, I don't know if you get a chance to see it, it's, it's when we made years ago, it's called Don't Become a Poster Child. Okay. Uh, when you leave the organization, 
And this is one of the things that kept us in. You would hear these talks about some young person who left and, and they went off and got shot or they got pregnant with nine kids and all that kind of stuff. And so you'd be sitting there like, well, I ain't leaving. I'm going to stay here. But you never heard about the witness kids who left and went mm-hmm. on to do well. And unfortunately, that doesn't really happen a lot as much as you would think, because what happens is oftentimes when people leave the organization, if they don't take the time to find out what they were a part of, let's say they got this fellowship, let's say they were involved in something, okay? They may have been involved in loose color, whatever, and they got this fellowship. Well, when they leave, they feel, you know, woe to me, I'm the wicked one, I'm the, un, you know, and this and that. And as a result, they never take the time to examine what they were a part of. And as a result, they live their life just like the witnesses said you would live your life. And it's an amazing thing how when people leave, you rarely will hear about the Jehovah's Witness kid who's hanging out with kids from MIT, kids who are going to be working for Google. And so this is why it's so important that when we leave, we let people see. And that's what the internet does. And like you three guys up here today, you're letting people know, look, you can leave and you'll be okay. You're going to be just fine. Just put one foot in front of the other and keep walking. And so this is what we try to do with our channel. Um, but but what you said is, is so true, man. I mean, uh, when you leave, go on and do well. And you'd be surprised. Like you said, we this is what makes this, this fellowship thing work. You can't talk to nobody. It's like the, 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 the story about the animal farm. The animals on the other side of the farm don't know what's going on. And so you think you are the only one out there and you're lost. We've talked to witnesses who came out in 76 after yeah. 1975 failed. Mm. And I have the greatest respect for these people, man, because they didn't have the internet. They didn't have all these different channels of touching base of other people who left like they did for the same reason and giving them a confirmation. I ain't going crazy. Watch that I was crazy. We're trying to tell they knew when God was going to end the world. And so today, this is what, this is a game changer now. The society cannot stop it now. People are, we have talked to young people, man. They'll be sitting in the kingdom hall texting back and forth to each other. They ain't what the watchtower say. I read it. I looked it up on the day myself. And so what, what you going to do with a group of young people like that? And you guys probably know, if you look back at your congregation right now, uh, the biggest problem they're having is they don't have young people doing anything. Oh, no. And and the ones that they do, they 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 browbeat you so much that you don't want to be a part of <laughs> Well, another thing, too, people don't realize, like, when you look at certain people like the, the Wayans family, the Wayans brothers, the Wayans brothers all were Jehovah's Witnesses, and they're doing exceedingly well. And there's some other folks who are who famous are doing it, but they don't they don't talk about that. You might even hear me and I had sent Rodney and Spencer a real famous uh, radio personality on in New York. His uh, name is Charlemagne the God. He had made, he posted this thing about Jehovah's Witnesses, and it was funny because all of us it was like wow, because there's a lot. You'd be surprised in Hollywood how many people who have been touched by the White Tower or aware of it. And who have been, but and a lot of them have been very successful. So you're mm-hmm. not a victim. I hate that victim mentality. You got to go get it. And and this is the life that you have. And and sure, woe is me. It's hard. I don't have a college degree. And but so what? You have an intelligence. You have a brain. You can obviously read and write. You can learn. So if you were able to do all that stuff in Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Sundays and spend that amount of time on nonsense, then you can do that on something that's going to enrich you and make you better. Right. You know what my question would be to you guys, too, is um, when you were growing up as a Jehovah's Witness, uh, did you ever have goals and things that you looked at and you were like, oh, man, I couldn't do this. I couldn't do that. Because I've talked to people that said that they were stripped of even dreaming. So did you fall into that category of not being able to dream? Yeah, I definitely didn't um, think of anything further than getting a job that would allow me to pioneer, that would allow me to be useful in Bethel. Um, you know, the way that my household was set up, we were centric. It was, that was the focus, that was the goals, and it was drilled into me. I was told to be good at school, but not too good, because you don't want to uh, invoke too much pressure from colleges. You know, I turned down private schools that was offering me, because all through my school life, I I was in the top of my class, um, graduated third in my class, and it could have been more, but I did not try in school because I did not want to have um, collegiate things pressed on for me, you know, 
So you, you, you will literally suppress your dreams. You will suppress your goals. You wanted to play sports. We played sports a lot. You know, I, I did not, I wasn't allowed to. Football was something I loved. I still love it. Um, but playing it was, was something I loved. And I really wanted to play. But it was out of the question. Not even a thought. You know, even playing football with witnesses, don't tackle because it's violent. And, you know, everything was just suppressed. Everything. You, you, you really see your life as a tool. You see yourself as a tool for expanding and, ex- and, and, and bringing glory to Jehovah's spiritual earthly organization. That's your job. That's your purpose. Um, you know, not to shame or anything. Um, my mom, when she had me, she, she took the Samuel approach. Um, you know, we, if you, you, give me, you give me this child, I'll give him to you. And I took that approach to heart. And I said, then I'm going to do that. I'm going to be everything that she needs me to be, everything that he needs me to be. God, of course, talking to Jehovah. Um, and goals were not, not, not in the question. It's not, it's a distraction. You're, you're, yeah. you're taken away. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I, I love basketball. I always wanted to play basketball and baseball in high school, but my dad, Never was, uh, you know, he just never supported it, never would, would encourage it. Um, I wanted to go to school for pro- sports journalism. And for me, I just kind of coasted through school and kind of just like, at the end of the day, I know I'm going to be a pioneer. I know I'm going to be a missionary. I was like, I, I was like we're going to travel the world and preach the message of God, you know? So everything that I wanted to do that wasn't specific, I even chastised myself for watching sports or even caring about the scores or even talking about sports. Um, so, you know, so a lot of people find themselves, you know, not getting educated and not going to school. So I just try to find little peace jobs I could, but then I started getting to a point, I was like, man, I have certain skills that I've already developed, talking to people, interacting with people, being able to relate to people. And I started to find different businesses that would take my skills that I already had, um, that wouldn't prevent me from, you know, being in debt or anything like that. My biggest thing was being in debt. Um, even when I left, I was like, you know, I want to do this stuff, but is it, am I going to be in debt? So a lot of people, I know a lot of people who leave probably find themselves in financial situations where it's tough. So um, sometimes you have natural abilities, like like Rodney said, and just kind of hone them. Rodney, his story is even more amazing, how he self-taught himself some stuff. I think Rodney should speak about some of the things you've recently learned and how you, Rodney's like a genius, literally. He is literally mm-hmm. a walking, talking genius. And without a college degree, he's, he's freaking you brilliant. Have, uh, your it's Saturdays and Sundays and you make use of them. You can do some things. Oh, yeah, so I, mean, I always had a, a a passion for like mathematics, engineering, that sort of thing. Will you have any sort of interest in the JW organization that's not directly related to preaching? It gets stifled. I mean, even the slightest thing. Like uh, uh, in my teenage years, I was really into music, uh, playing guitar. And I know me and myself and Spencer and a couple of other friends, we had this sort of library of instrumental music that we would listen to. I mean, no words in it at all. And we would still have to censor the title of the song and and hide it from from Spencer's mother <laughs> primarily, <laughs> but from some of the other adults too. And this the, these songs had no words in them at all. So there's no way that they could possibly be demonic. But because the title had spirit or something like in that in it, or because the artist had a cross tattoo on his neck, we would have to hide these these songs. So I mean that just goes to show the extent that your interest would be stifled if they're not directly related to preaching. So, but after being this fellowship and having all this time uh, to myself, you know, I, I just delved into things like music, delved into mathematics, delved into electronics, and uh, eventually ended up uh, securing a job in the engineering field with no degree. Uh, so, that, I mean, that just goes to show that even if you've been held back or, or restrained in some kind of way, uh, by the Jehovah's Witness organization, you you still have the opportunity. We're fortunate enough to those who live in, in a, a reasonably developed country, fortunate enough to be able to put forth the effort to make your life into what you want it to be. Um, and you have your Saturdays and Sundays and you have your evenings now. So that's more time for you because you're not out there preaching 70 plus hours a, a week and doing all this other stuff. Um, so I, I really think it's of the utmost importance to grill in on, on what brings you fulfillment, whatever that may be. For me, like I mentioned before, it's mathematics, it's electronics, but to you, it might be pottery, it might be painting, it might be car- carving wood block, whatever it is. You really have to key in on that 
and and draw in fulfillment from that. Awesome. Very good. I mean, this, good. These, 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 these stories are just, uh, they're just off the chain. This is what makes me so frustrated as, because I come from, in, from poverty. I come from public housing. I come from a lower income background and a single parent as well. When you take being black, you take being a Jehovah's Witness, you take being no college degree, you take those three ingredients and you can really mess people's lives up. And it's such a it's such a terrible thing when you see these folks in the inner city. You know, we all from a certain area. All, all three of us are from the inner city. When you when you take these people not to go to college, not to get educated and do things, you're literally preventing them to be able to take care of themselves. And so when we have economic issues like what's going on right now with the coronavirus, and, and not everyone has the privilege of working from home, or has the privilege of having that. They may have these little half job, you know, piece of jobs, little half a job here because they know the new world is coming. Okay. Now, they, not only are they in more financial problems, but the Watchtower doesn't set up a way for you to be assisted. They, the Watchtower does not believe in having a situation where they can assist folks, who witnesses who need financial help and assistance. Mm -hmm. They are really happy to take your land. They're really happy to take your donations. They're really happy to pay child sex abuse uh, um, uh, claims, but they don't really take care of their people. When, you've, when they don't have an outreach part, even worldly, so-called worldly churches, so-called the ones that um, they are giving food and they are donating things to these folks, that at least some of them are stepping up. The Watchtower does not do that. So that shows you how they value the workers. You're just a number. You're All you are is just the numbers that you put in in field service. And, and people are really suffering economically and, 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 and hurting because of this. It's terrible. Yeah. And the Jehovah's Witnesses also have a situation where they, it's what have you done for me lately? So if I haven't put in these hours for this month, last month, I'm, I'm, miss, I'm missing for the last two months. And now all of a sudden it's like, well, you weren't here for two months. Well, my dad is retired from the Air Force and he retired many years ago. And when we would go on the military base, the security guard at the gate would be saying, thank you for your service, sir. You know, this is like 30, 40 years ago that he retired. And they're still thanking him for his service. But Jehovah's Witnesses, you miss one month in field service, and it's like you don't you're believe in God me. anymore. You know, you're you're demonic. You're you're apostate. You're you know, you left the truth. You you know, you're crazy. You know, you're mentally diseased. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's crazy. Reading and write, reading and writing makes you mentally diseased. Yeah. If you're yeah. coming from an impoverished state, uh, too, I think that also puts you in a position of uh, increased vulnerability. Uh, like my case, for example, my my mother and father, I love both of them dearly. Uh, my mother, father, both drug addicts. My father, who I lived with at the time, was an alcoholic, abusive, uh, verbally mostly. But uh, so as a 13 year old, that put me in a position where I was in need of guidance. I didn't know what, you know, what to do. I was hungry. I needed food. And for a group of people to come and they give you the guidance that you need, they give you the, the, the food you know, the physical sustenance, sustenance that I need, of course I was going to join. Of course I was going to go and follow behind them. And that makes it even more difficult to leave uh, because, because these are the people who helped me in a situation where I really needed. The people that took me under their wing, that taught me uh, as I was coming of age how to be an adult. And I, I value those lessons I learned from them. I really appreciate them. And to have that severed just because uh, you know, three brothers in the back room decided it should be that way organizationally. How do you, how do you ever fully come to, to grips with that? Where do you get closure from that? And in my case, I don't think you ever really do. You just have to accept that that's just going to be a loose string that dangles out there uh, forever, and you make you make bonds elsewhere. Yeah, you have a good, you have a really interesting experience because we did interview another young guy. Um, it was it a couple years ago and he talked about he was recruited and from a person in his class and he woke up and he was appreciative of what he learned as a Jehovah's Witness as well. But when he woke up to the truth about the truth, then he said, I had to go. But he doesn't forget about what he learned. And a lot of people on our YouTube channel, they'll make comments on some videos and they'll say, do you still believe in God? What are you doing now? Do you still credit the organization for things that they've done? Well, we never said that we didn't get some good counseling or some good instructions. We just said we got a, we left when we realized we had been sold a bill of goods. 
you know. Yeah. They gave you some great sales techniques. They showed you how to sell stuff. I mean, it's a, it's a sales organization. <laughs> Uh, as I, I mean, as I tell people, use the skills that they gave you. If they're going to give you some theocratic skills, repurpose them into an economic skill. You know what I mean? You ain't got a degree, but you know how to talk to people. You know how to hawk the magazine, so you can use those skills. <laughs> You're funny, <laughs> Rodney. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, see, we know you're using your skills to, to, the, to, to the umpteenth degree. I mean, you go get your real estate license. You saw you selling real estate. What you doing? No, no, no. I have my own uh, business. I work in I work in custom clothing and suits and stuff. So I do okay, okay. suits and stuff. So I, even though I don't, even though I left the suits, I still sell some suits. Oh, that's not wrong. That's not wrong. Yeah, but I don't feel I don't feel the uh, I don't feel the pressure uh, of the uh, you know the latest watch time and wake uh, beating down me. You know, so I I kind of you know. So it's interesting how you meet people. And again, you you just got to use what you're given. Life is life is hard, man. Life is hard. But sometimes you take the the cards that you're dealt. And you can take that hand, and that hand can be a winning hand. It doesn't have to be a losing hand. You can't you, being a victim. Like me and Roddy talk about this, and you can't be a victim. It's you guys have had to get education. I've talked to you guys several times. You guys got your degrees and stuff like that. Life is hard. You put in at least 20, 30 hours a week going to the Kingdom Hall and studying and stuff. You can do twenty and thirty hours of self enrichment and reading. People have to be solution based. You know, just leaving the organization is. It's not always a bad thing. It could be, I mean, I remember my first time going to the movies without feeling bad that somebody's going to judge me about this or that or, 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 or eating a sandwich and, at a certain restaurant or doing this and doing that. I'm um, like, you know, I, whatever, you know, I even tell people who serve, thank you for your service too. I, I used to feel bad about telling people who served in the military, thank you for their service. Now I can just say that. I'm not, I'm not necessarily a big pro this and pro that, but I respect people, p- people and stuff like that. So it just, the freedom that you have out just to be able to walk outside of the park and not feel like you're judging people. You feel like you got to give them a magazine or, or a track or, or this or that just to walk normally and just to literally just people watch without feeling like you got to preach to them. It feels great. Yes, it does. It feels good knowing that the people around you, not thinking that they're all going to die in the near future. You know, as, as you keep on hearing um, the governing body, keep on putting different, terminology on how close it is to everyone dying and i mean you know it's it's just one of those things that you have to say to yourself out loud you know my belief system is that 99.9 percent of the earth and its population deserve to die because they don't believe what i believe and these things are the biggest rewards um learning that that's not the way you should be living and not if you have if you if you hold on to the concept of sin redefining it in a way that's practical that is not based off of the standards of a bunch of old guys in new york that are completely out of touch with society with the real world um or at least pretend to be um and and being able to build your own set of characteristics and realize that you're not a sheep-like one anymore. You're not a sheep. I mean, that's on the outside. Hearing that, it's insulting. It's it's yeah. insulting. You know, the the term sheep is not an endearing term, and it's real. You know, the fact that they use that to their people. You know, be yourself. Find your freedom. Find the love that is true, and that you can build a life on. Yeah, what do you think about the people that you've hear, heard about that were suicidal or people that actually committed suicide? And how did that touch any of you, hearing about those things? I, I just say, like, for me, like I said, me dating a young lady who was sexually abused, and she's had several suicide attempts in her life, you know, when I was dating her. And she had several suicide attempts. And it was and all tied to what she had been through and how it was handled. And for me, to, for society to have the blood on the hands, not just from suicides, but from blood transfusions and giving false information about medical stuff in an area that they're not even qualified to speak about, no matter how they try to dress it up, and whatever. Some people need these things and using really ambiguous and broad scriptural basis for something that is not in the scriptures, the Bible, and to take the Bible and manipulate and control it, it's sad. They have the, 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 the governing body that specifically has a lot of blood on their hands. And, and I don't know how to, the only way that I can only imagine them going to sleep is they have to be that delusional 
to be able to actually go to sleep at night and think that what they're doing is right. They literally have to be delusional. They drink their own Kool-Aid. Yeah. And they ain't got no sugar in Get high on your own supply is really what it is, you know, being able to say something over and over again until you believe it yourself. Uh, I, I know people who have fallen victim to very hard drugs, um, who have been found in states that could have killed them. Um, I know individuals who have who've felt suicidal, who have um, turned to dependencies because they don't have an uh, outlet. Or like you was talking about before, you know, the, an animal that's free from a farm thinks that they're out here alone. They don't realize how many things actually are there for them, you know, and it could result in someone either disregarding their well-being or taking their life entirely. And the witnesses won't. They'll never fess up to that. They'll never put that in their watchtowers, you know, and if they do, somehow they'll spin it on the fact that they have fallen to some demonic influence and it forced them to take their life. And friends, this is why we shouldn't leave. They'll use it to their advantage. Um, and the sad part, like you was talking about being a poster child, you, no matter what you do, they'll look at you and feel like you're doing something that follows their guideline of what happens when you leave our safety net, you know, and, and it's in, like we was talking about really just finding your own, Rob said, don't be a victim, you know, go over and take, take a part of your life, take it back because they took it from you. You guys represent people who are not trying to just do, leave to do bad, or just, I'm not going to be a witness because I want to do all these things over here, or I'm trying to sow my wild oats kind of thing. Because some people, when they leave, they're like, look, JT, where's your beard? You still look like a Jehovah's Witness. You know, I told JT, grow your beard so I can see your beard. And JT's like, that's just not him. You know, he comes from a different generation. So yeah, yeah. that's Respect. just him. That's just, this is him. <laughs> and it's like let him let JT be him. Why y'all gotta make him look See, this any is, other way? This is the thing, man. You know? We spent our entire life letting somebody tell us what to do. You can't turn and do it all over again. You gotta be crazy. Nope. The thing with beers is beers has never been a see, most people don't know why the witnesses have Russell wore a beard. Rutherford hated him. He actually hated Russell. And so yeah. guys at Bethel were all walking around with those beers like Russell had. And when he became president, like, get that stuff out. It had nothing to do with the Bible, Jesus, Moses. <laughs> and this is the whole problem in the organization. There's so many things in the organization that have nothing to do with the Bible. This is some personal dude. Let me ask you a question. When I went to Bethel, one of the first questions I asked, why do we have that funky music that we sing at the Kingdom Hall? <laughs> it turns out, it turns out, that a member of the governing body, he's into classical music. That's what he likes, Bach, Beethoven. So that's why all the kingdom song for years sound like you was like you was an orchestra. That's why you had no soul in the music. You had no no culture. Witnesses are an international religion. You would think they would have songs that would reflect the different no for years. And so I found that 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 that, that um, Carl Klein who was a member of the governing body. He was put in charge of music. So he chose the music that he wanted, which is fine. But then he, but then he, he named it and branded it as "This is from God." That's the problem in the organization. A lot of yeah. brothers have different views on stuff. That's fine. But what happens is their views become laws of God. Mm -hmm. That's the yeah. problem. Like, but the maybe, funny you, thing maybe, you, maybe you don't want. Maybe you don't want a transfusion. Maybe you yeah. don't want to. That certain sexual things you and your wife and your girlfriend don't want to do freaky stuff. That's fine if you don't want to do it, but you don't turn around and then make eight million people do what you don't do, and then yeah. name it by God, disfellowship you for not doing it. You can't do that. That's, that's the infuriating part of it. Like that's infuriating. You can see they just be making this up as they go along. They make you saw them up, coming out the liquor store with a cart that was yeah. piled taller than he was with like you know the things with five three hundred dollar wine. And you know, it's like you, you, <laughs> yeah, bottle gate. You know, it's like what, what, gate, you yeah. know, you're imposing yourself upon other people, and you calling yourself God. You know, the way that they've taken the other hundred and forty-four thousand and said they're not actually 
Like it's us. It's just us. Like it's just, <laughs> that, it's just, that, it's just that was us. a power move. That was a power. That was a power. Move. Chief, you got to you got to respect that. You got to respect that. That, that was, was a serious power, power move. move. I was like, I know they have some Kool Aid now, boy. They, they, they just, said it's and, and everybody just had to eat it. You know, it's just one of those things. You know, they said we make the rules, and everything we say is directly guided by God. Don't ask anything. Like if you ask, you're tantamount to just questioning God. Like, Chief, that's what it is. It's a power trip. Master power trip. <laughs> While they in the back trading stocks and bonds with voluntary donations, you know, I'm not even trying to hear it. <laughs> No way, no, it's ridiculous. Well, look, we heard about the a brother that um that called us a couple weeks ago. Oh, yeah, and he told us that um the the this one congregation thing in Florida said everybody that had gone to the store to buy goods and stuff for this per, uh, this pandemic mm-hmm. bring all of your stuff to the kingdom hall, and then the brothers would decide you know when to give it back to you. So I said to him, I said, wait, wait, wait. I said, you're not making any sense. I said, let me break this down. You mean I went to Costco, me and JT go to Costco. We buy toilet paper, Lysol, you know, hand wipes, all that kind of stuff. And then the brothers are saying, bring that to the kingdom hall and drop it off. And then they will decide what we need and when we need it. And he said, that's right. That's exactly what the brother told him. Communism. And I said, they wouldn't have been able to do that to my mom. Yeah, that was, my grandmother would have been like communism, just like straight up and down. That's authoritarian government. Like, what are you talking about? They just seized your goods <laughs> and redistributed it as they felt. It wasn't organization wide. It was just this group of brothers. So you're Jehovah's Witnesses. You are in a specific congregation with crazy people. They do crazy things. And they end up taking advantage of people, you know? Mm-hmm. Because questioning those wow. brothers, questioning God. Yeah. Even That's those right. brothers on a local level, you're yeah. still questioning God. You're questioning God's spirit directed organization. Yes. That's, that's the problem, you know, conflating what man says with God. And that was the hardest part for me, hearing about, you know, my girlfriend's view on Christianity, how that the man is not the God. And I had, I didn't realize that was my mentality the whole time, you know? That what they say is actually, like you're not God, you yeah, can't. Yeah, you're not God. You you from all the older witnesses? They'll say we know the elders, but the elders said the elders said, and you're like, well, the elders ain't nobody. I mean. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they uneducated men as well. Like most of them, not, they don't even get at what they do at work. Like, yeah. <laughs> oh my God! Oh, he didn't. He said that. Uh, that one I've never heard before. Oh, man. Yeah. Like that. Like, yeah, work yeah. with a couple of them, man. Y'all, y'all not as what y'all think a lot, even in your secular lives. Yeah, you know, exactly. It is what it is. You know, oh my God. Regular people. Oh, you got that. Regular people. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> well, anyway, we. I'm gonna come and close this. Right. So thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Critical Thought. This has been Lady C. This has been JT. This is Spencer. This is Robert. This is Rodney. <laughs> Take care. All right. All right. This program was sponsored by Critical Thinkers.